Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Being Patient. I'm Deborah Khan and we have a special edition today of Ask Me Anything with caregiver coach extraordinaire Tipa Snow. Uh, Tipa, as many of you have seen her here before, is an authority on caregiving. Personally, I find what she has to say so helpful to um, apply it to situations with my mom because in the past, she can relate to changes um, in the brain to behavioral changes. And I find that extraordinarily helpful um, in having compassion and patience um, with caregiving. So Tipa, always so great to see you. And thank you again so much for joining us. Always, you do such wonderful work in the world. So it's great to join you because it's that's opportunities to answer the questions people have in really effective ways, but also very honest ways, because that's the thing that you bring to the table is here's the information. Here's what we really know before, you know, we just blindly accept something because it, you know, somebody said it. So absolutely. And, you know, when we were thinking about, we were like, oh, we haven't seen Tifa in a while. Let's invite her back. And we have so many comments that people leave when we post an interview of you that we thought, you know what, let's let everyone ask whatever question they want. And, you know, we got a flood of questions, of course. Um, I'm going to start with some that we got, but for those of you who are watching, please feel free to ask your questions. We're going to visit them live as, as they come in. Um, and that's the point of today, really, is just to really ask Tipa anything. And to have her at our disposal for the next uh, hour or so is, is amazing. So First, um, Tifa, let's start with um, somebody who has just been diagnosed. Um, this person wrote to us and said, Tifa, I was diagnosed with the beginning stage of Alzheimer's, um, late on stage. I live alone and I can do all things with the help of Alexa um, and my daughter who lives around the corner from me if I need her short term memory loss um, and my daughter um, does is the meds that I'm currently on um, you know, help from her, uh, his daughter. When do you know when you're beginning moderate stage and how long will I stay in this stage? Now, that's a really good question from, coming from somebody who's been diagnosed. So yeah. Tifa, how do people know when they're moving from one stage to another? Well, and it's interesting because the challenge is um, this is someone who has incredible amounts of self-awareness. So in this instance, we have someone whose prefrontal cortex is pretty intact, you know, so yes, memory issues, but so far the ability to control impulses to say things like, I'm fine, I don't need anything, mm -mm. recognizing Alexis is helpful, daughter is helpful, I'm alone now, but I don't know how long. The ability to be logical and reasonable in, in reaching conclusions, the ability to make decisions that are consistent with values, and the ability to recognize, I need to know when to initiate something different. So I'm going to go ahead with that a little bit because we initiate and then we accurately sequence through things and then we finish something and then we're ready to move on to something else that we initiate. So one of the hallmarks for most people living with Alzheimer's is that I start to struggle. One of the indicators I'm moving more toward the middle is I start to struggle with that transition from I'm done and now, huh, what do I do now? So the ability to move through your day with well, I get up, I go to the bathroom, I fix coffee. I, and with the help of Lexus, you, you know, Lexus may say, have you had your medication yet? You know, it's nine o'clock and your brain goes, oh yeah, click my meds. And, and you can go through the, go to the kitchen, get a drink, open the med container, take the pills, you know, wash out the glass, you know, what all the steps it takes to take your pills and then you're, then either Alexa or you goes, you know, now it's time to fix breakfast. And so then you can initiate the fixing of the breakfast. What you might notice, or you might not, might take your daughter noticing, is that that's not enough anymore. So even though you get the message, it's time to fix breakfast. 
your brain goes, oh yeah, fix breakfast. And how do I do, how do I start that? Uh, how do I start that? You know, what's the first step in starting breakfast? And it's like breakfast. I mean, so how do you fix breakfast, Deborah? Let's just like, let's put it on the table. How do you, what's the very first step of fixing breakfast? What do you do first? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> I make my coffee. The other person isn't here, so I'm just going to ask you. I make, well, I, this is role playing with Deepa. Yes, I yeah. make my coffee. You make your coffee. So, what's the first step of making coffee? Boiling the water. Okay. What's the first step of boiling the water? Filling the kettle with water. What's the first step of filling the kettle with water? So, do you see how this? Yes. We, we take something that, quote unquote, is not that hard because we do it every day and we do it automatically. But all of a sudden, I'm starting to have breakpoints in my daily routines where what used to be smooth, I can make coffee and then fix my cereal. And I could remember what's the start point and transition point for each of those things. And we layer it and layer it and layer it. And all of a sudden I'm finding myself in a swamp where I'm like, crap. And so Lex is telling me to fix breakfast isn't helpful anymore because now I can't, I can't remember the steps how do I start that? Or I get in the middle of it and Lexa says, now it's time to get your clothes on. And it's like, oh, okay, but I haven't necessarily finished. And so I might notice that or somebody looking at the setup might go, your daughter, for instance, Lexus is not so good at it, but, or Lexus might say, you left the lights on and it's like, oh, I left the lights on. Oh, okay. You know, oh, you didn't talk, lock the door. So when you start noticing or somebody notices, wow, even with Lexus help and even with daughters chewing episodically, you're having a harder time getting through a day. Yeah. That it's typically always, it's signals. always the sequence of orders. Like I, as a as somebody observing the caregiver, my mom, um, it's it's sequences that started to disappear, right? And so, you know, something like cooking became impossible. And when yeah. she was a gourmet cook, right? And yeah. so it's remembering those sequences. And I, I, I guess as from the patient perspective, it's how difficult things are getting to complete yeah. on your own, right? And Yeah, and or, you know, for some people who have great self-awareness, you go, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just realized yeah. I have the lettuce out and I don't know what to do next. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I have people say that to me. But on the yeah. other hand, I've had people say, oh, yeah, no, I'm fine. And it's like, but you never made salad. And it's like, what do you mean I never made salad? Yeah, I think that's well, sure I made common. salad. What are you talking about? Of course I made salad. I always made salad. So, yeah, I think you know, the, the denial phase is probably more common. And this person is unique in that self-awareness. Well, interesting, Deborah. It's actually 50-50 for people. Really? Yeah, it really is. About 50% of us have our awareness pretty decent. Right. pretty into the middle. And it's like, I know I need guidance, but when we ask for it, what do I do now? People will say, well, you, we get frustrated as carers and we say, we make people feel worse. And then we make their brain anxious by saying, well, what do you do to fix breakfast? I, I want to yeah. say, I mean, if I were the person, I'd say, if I knew that I wouldn't be asking you. Okay? <laughs> right. I mean, right. Hear what I'm saying and understand what I'm yeah. trying to tell you is I no longer know what I do next. And so a simple startup, you know, turn the key in the ignition would be, tell you what, how about getting the glass out of the cabinet and, okay. and using a gesture. Right. So Deepa, I want to move because we're yeah. getting lots of questions and okay, I want to make sorry. sure. Everyone... Okay, good. Okay. So this, um, Angela has just written, my mother-in-law lives with us and now she's having hallucinations. What can ah. we do and how long will this continue? Now that I can vouch for this, that is a really tough phase of this disease so yeah and so one of the things I usually if I if I ask people what type of dementia do you know what type of dementia your mom is living with um, because if the person is living with Lewy body dementia it's like welcome to the world of Lewy body you're going to be doing this it depends on um, how much anxiety stress or distress your mom is experiencing the Lewy body the hallucinations can be extreme and scary and awful they're mostly going to be at night or in the afternoon. They'll involve animals, children, or people, uh, or shadows, or things like that. 
On the other hand, if it's uh, another form of dementia, I might be curious about, um, okay, she well, just let's- just wrote in TIPA, she doesn't know what kind of dementia, ah, which is very common for very a lot common. of people out there. Yeah. We get the syndrome of dementia, but we don't get the yes. diagnosis of which one we're living with. Yes. Um, so if it comes up suddenly and it's a hallucination, I need to know whether or not, have we verified that she doesn't have a urinary tract infection, an upper respiratory infection? She doesn't have a new med on board. She doesn't have sleep issues going on because we want to make sure that that symptom is not indicative of something deeper happening. That's not actually the dementia. It's an acute something on top of the dementia. Um, for people who do just have starts noticing and seeing things inaccurately, and rather than hallucination, I say they see things inaccurately. Sometimes it's from memory, sometimes it's from imagination, and sometimes it's from emotion. So, for instance, if I say, well, I talked, you know, I was, there was that man outside. My first comment to someone is, so you saw a guy outside. Was he scaring you or was you were you just curious about him? So acknowledgement is key, key. And I've done this because you've told me to do this and it works, right? It's like, <laughs> there, there's no, like saying there's no man across the street doesn't do anything. Yes, there is. Yes, it, there is. But there is so saying, why were you not? Why are you yeah. being like this? Can you not see him? I'm telling you, he's right there. And you want to argue with their brain. And it's like their brain is broken. Yeah. I mean, you got that, right? I mean, you know that. And yet your brain wants to fix it. And it's like, when you learn how to do that, you let me know. I'll make you lots of money because I have people who want to know that. <laughs> well, in my family, I say, listen to Tipa, step into their reality. That's what you taught me. And that is that is so key to uh, just just moving through some of the obstacles you you hit. Yeah, right? I can it's only use the brain they have. I mean, yeah. if they don't have that part of their brain working, if their brain is showing them a person, it means the visual cortex came up with a human being that they're seeing. Now, it's fake. I got it. But they're seeing it. I mean, it, we would register activity in the occipital lobe. We could actually register. Their brain is very active in the occipital area. And their brain is also very active in the amygdala area, which is the threat perceiver. If the person says, well, he's trying to break in. Well, that's not okay. Tell you what, we need to get to a safer place then. If he's trying to get it, and I am going to go turn lights on and see if we can't get him out of here, because that's not all right. And I think, I think what you're getting at, and I think about this all the time, because I see it too with my mom is like people who have been diagnosed with dementia they still feel they they so emotion becomes everything right and so the ability to really just like respond because their brain is not broken in terms of feeling emotion and so that emotion like when you see a man and he's not there to us but to to them he's here you've got to acknowledge that because that's what because if I don't, yeah. they th then we we put the barrier between us and I yeah. need the barrier to be out there. So if I turn the lights on and off and he disappears. What it, I mean, I can tell you the physiological thing that happened in the brain. It doesn't really matter because what happened is the two of you came together to deal with a situation that was scaring her. Yeah. And now it's not scaring her anymore. Yeah. And all you did. So get over it. You flick the light switch a few times. I mean, if that works. Yay. And if it doesn't say, well, let's get to a safer place and I'm going to see what I can find out about this. Cause that's not okay. That somebody's looking in the window. Then okay. tomorrow, what I might do is put a curtain yeah. before we get to nightfall or before the reflection starts to happen, because it could simply be our own reflection in the glass. Oh, interesting. I didn't even think of that. Interesting. Of course. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna keep going because we're getting lots of questions and I'm, I'm like, my heart is beating because I wanna get to everyone's question. Okay, so Lisa writes, my mom is in a late stage of Alzheimer's. She's nonverbal, immobile, requires assistance with every aspect of living. She's having some difficulty in swallowing recently. The staff at her care home would like to have her on a daily dose of risperidone as opposed to as needed. Um, I agree, what are your thoughts? now? You know, I think you're probably going to say I don't give medical advice, but you but that'd be safe first. But you also saw my face. I know yeah. people saw my face if they're watching. Um, unfortunately, risperidone. What I hear, I think, is that um, there's also something behavioral going on. 
because risperidone is an antipsychotic and we use antipsychotics are used in dementia off label. Yeah. They haven't that. been tested totally on off label. Yeah. They are used to manage distress. However, it suppresses the central nervous system. And one of the things it suppresses is fine motor control and smooth muscle control. So the reason you saw my face get really anxious is as an OT, I do do a lot of work on chewing, sucking, swallowing, breathing, and it's, it's how we eat. And so, you know, being able to eat safely or drink safely keeps us alive. So if we give someone a medication that impairs the fine motor control in their mouth, lips, tongue, epiglottal area, uh, their sphincter muscles that allow the, the liquid or the food to go past the airway and into the esophagus, and then for the person to open their epiglottis and breathe again. That's really scary to me as, as someone who uh, is concerned about the risk of aspiration pneumonia. So really looking at, so tell me what the behavior is that we're using risperidone for. And let's look at could it be how we're trying to get the food or liquid in? Because trying to poke someone in, in someone's mouth when they don't even know what we're trying to do is distressing, which is why we'll recommend using what we call hand under hand support. Even if the person can't use their hands or their arms, putting my arm under there so they feel my movement toward my, their mouth and I work on an, an elaborate scoop can really make a difference. And we have a few little videos on our website. If you, you know, if you're really curious and interested, I would say it's worth a, we do free consults. It's a, worth a free consult because that's not actually making sense to my brain without more data. So I think it's, I wouldn't, that would be like, Ooh, need to know a lot more about that. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, Tipa, we hear this so much from people within our community that they are prescribed antipsychotics, their loved ones are. And, you know, the truth is none of these drugs have been tested on dementia patients. And so, you know, maybe in some people, they, they help calm a symptom, but we don't know what the impact is. And so that's what I love about you. You're looking at, like, I, I think there's a tendency in the later stage to not treat um, people with dementia as humans. And so what you just said really jumped out at me. How is that person being administered food? Are they being shoved food in their mouth when they don't really want it? Or is it scary or who's doing it? And I think that's something we kind of forget, right? Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I, that resonated yeah, like a lot. Suppressing the system when what she's really already trying to do is communicate. And the distress communication is that we keep trying to do something she doesn't get, or her brain is saying it's not safe. It's not safe anymore. Yeah. Because I will say human brains can sometimes recognize putting stuff in my mouth doesn't feel safe. I don't know what to do with it. Remember that I don't know what to do with it. Well, when you put fluid in your mouth, the next step is you have to bring it together at the center of your tongue, and then you have to force your tongue to bring it to the back of your mouth. And then you lose control over it as it goes past your airway into the, in your esophagus has to open. It's highly complicated. And if your brain is getting impaired, it could be saying, I'm afraid I'll lose control. I don't want to do this. Can I be done? And we're having a hard time listening. Okay, uh, and that Jill is writing to us saying, I work with family caregivers of those caring for a loved one with dementia. I'm hearing more about uh, people um, living with dementia, having to go to hospital mm -hmm. and when they're there and when they come out, their condition has drastically advanced. Uh, we've actually done a talk on um, like, you know, increased delusions, overall decline, even to the point of swearing off uh, future ER visits, even if needed. What is it about hospitals, how hospitals um, affect people living with dementia? Hospitals are the most dangerous places for people living with dementia. And over 50% of people moderate to severe state dementia will end up in one each year. Um, it's really not designed for dementia. The communication system isn't designed for dementia. The care system isn't designed for dementia. Um, even the training of staff Staff are not trained in the care of people living with dementia. 
people go into the hospital to fix something. So we're either going to do surgery, we're going to do treatment, we're evaluating. And so we're doing really uncomfortable and painful things to people in unfamiliar ways. And we're telling them what we're doing with words they can't always comprehend. So it's a setup and they're supposed to stay in a bed and they're not supposed to get out. And we tie them up to equipment that they have to remember to take with them. And then we use medications that are meant to make them less able to do things because we want them sedated for uh, like an evaluation of swallowing or an evaluation of a broken arm. So we have so many things going on and people are so unaware. What ends up happening is people are managed. And unfortunately, the management is very high risk for function. And if you're having trouble using the bathroom and you fall, then let's put in a catheter because we can't, I mean, we don't need to be doing that kind of care. And, you know, if you've had surgery, so a catheter goes in. Coming out of surgery and you find something indwelling in you, there's a high risk. You'll go, what is that? I don't like that and pull it out. Well, now we have, I mean, and so it snowballs and falls are very high risk. Injuries are high risk. Um, a quote unquote, becoming aggressive and resistive is high risk, losing weight, losing ADL skills. So it is really a risky proposition. And so we have selected hospitals that are working on becoming dementia knowledgeable. And they're often what are called niche hospitals, N-I-C-H-E. It's part of a national nursing initiative um, and so they're really designed to really try to recognize we need a different model where we're going to be able to have eyes on and support for and programming for people who don't have the ability to control impulses, think it through, make good choices, know their own limitations. And we're trying to figure out what's going on with them. I mean, this it's is so badly needed. It is oh, so badly so needed. Thank you so much for um, taking on that initiative. I, I, you know, my mom's been in the hospital too, and I agree. It's been a horrible experience. Um, yeah, my it, mom ended up with a head injury on top of her. <laughs> I mean, even just the way to communicate, not everyone knows this, right? So, well, okay. you know, they're trying to use the communication, but it's the TV control. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And somebody's yelling at them. What did you push the call bell for? Yeah. Can you tell me what you need? It's just like, yeah. hello, hello. Um, so you mentioned just now agitation. So this is a good segue. Um, Lisa asks, what would you suggest for agitation at various times of uh, the day? Um, the agitation is not necessarily when she's eating. Um, she will begin to breathe heavy, rub her hands vigorously, grab for things like that type of kind of nervous agitation. Okay. So what you're telling me is this is a very anxious behavior that escalates to a physical anxiety. So she's trying some self-soothing techniques, but when you breathe really fast in light like that, you actually deoxygenate. So one of the things I'll classically ask people to do is I, I have a technique where you, you take shake hands and then you take the hand and your thumbs are together and you can apply tension and pressure on the thenar eminence, and you can also put a little tension on the web space, and you pump on and off, and you gradually slow with the pumping, and you go. You're really worried. I hear you're worried. Breathe with me. And we work on pursed out, nose in, pursed out. And because we're connected neurologically, I'm giving proprioceptive deep pressure input. If the person is right-handed, I'm on the right side and I'm going, this is scary. I'm here. This is not okay. I've got you. I hear you. Let's figure it out. All right. All right. Now, what do you notice about my voice as I start in that higher and come You're down? You're lowering your voice. Yeah. What else do you notice about you're my speaking speech? slower and you're uh, calming? Yeah. But I've got to be willing to start where the person shows me they are. I come up underneath and I support them and I bring them gradually shift them down because what's happened is 
frequently in dementia, something alarms the primitive brain and the primitive brain goes into cortisol, cortisol, adrenaline, and it's dumping on the human being. And if you've ever had cortisol and adrenaline jump on you, it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And unfortunately, it came out of nowhere. And in this case, the person doesn't even have any awareness of why all of a sudden this is starting to happen. And with Lewy body, it can just be the Lewy body's going, gotcha. And with some dementias, it's there's a sound, there's a movement that they couldn't figure out. There's a memory that pops up. But in that moment, my job is to recognize that level of acute um, neurological distress and start to weave it down. And if they say, I've got to get out of here, I've got to get out of here, I'll say, you're wanting out of here. This doesn't feel safe. I hear you. Listen, you're not feeling safe here. Okay, let's figure out what's not okay here. And within a and few it's, breaths. It's almost empowering in a sense that you're acknowledging feelings and saying, okay, now you're controlling this conversation. You tell me what you need. You yeah. tell me what's wrong, right? I mean, I can't fix if I'm not listening. And and right. that's the, you know, when I just see all this and I go, what's wrong? What's wrong? If they knew that, they would have said, you know, there's something really wrong with me. I could really use your help. All I'm getting is they can't even come out and ask me. But can I ask, like, yeah. Why, why is this so bad? Why not just let them do this? Because it's not working. You're telling oh. me that, oh God, oh, oh. If I was doing this and this was satisfying me, I would look at <laughs> <only> this. <laughs> and you should let them do that. Right. Okay. Okay. If you have a smile, let it go. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is- If they're uh, humming. If Sorry. they're humming, let it go. If, if they're humming, yeah, because humming is stupid, uh, right? Uh, 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 if they've got a rhythm and it's comfortable, you can tell when someone is using uh, adrenaline and cortisol versus they're using dopamine and endorphins. I mean, there's a real different feel to yeah. it. Okay, um, this is this is, I've lived through this. And it's really difficult. And I can tell you enjoyed it. The shower, the shower. Oh. Okay, Laura writes, and I'm right there with you, Laura. I've had this, we've had, my sister and I have actually taken our clothes off and hopped in the shower with our bras and underwears and, and showered with our mom to just make her take a shower, it right? Feel normal. The water suddenly became a terrifying thing. So Laura yeah. writes, my mother's in mid-stage Alzheimer's. She's very reluctant to shower and change her clothes. Tried numerous techniques, but would love to hear your approaches. And then Cheryl writes, adding to the bathing topic, navigating when the person states no issues, no assistance needed um, in an assisted living um, assessment doesn't relate to time between showers. Okay, so that's very true <laughs> as well. The frequency is totally a different thing. So. Yeah, let's do the frequency because it's a little, it leads into the other one. So what happens is in hippocampal damage, when you have a hippocampus that's damaged, which is like the hallmark of Alzheimer's and many dementias, one of the things the hippocampus helps you do is keep up with how long it's been since. It's, it's also, in addition to memory, it's also responsible for wayfinding and keeping up with the passage of time. So if I always take a shower every morning, and I develop Alzheimer's, my brain says to me, well, you've, you've got clothes on. Of course you took a shower. I mean, it's 9 a.m. And you get up at 5.30. So you already had your shower. My brain misses that for the past seven days, 15 days, two months, I actually haven't done that. And so I'm actually in the same clothing because what I didn't do is at the end of the day, get into PJs. Or even if I did, I put the same clothes back on and I skipped a shower. So this is really important that we're aware that's brain failure. Okay, so me saying you did not is just gonna start an argument and agitation. So I'll go, oh, hey, Deborah, I have a huge favor to ask of you. I see you have that beautiful orange top on that has all kinds of stains and smells because there's body odor on it. Don't say that part. You can think <laughs> it, but don't say it. I have this big favor. 
you have a peach colored one, like this one, I'm holding it up. I would love for you to wear that when we go out today. You look so good in it. Listen, tell you what, we have a few minutes. How about if you go switch out here? Can you get the zipper in the back or could you use a little help? Now we go into the bathroom. Okay. Have I said a word about bathing yet? Don't talk about it when you're not anywhere near it. Because if I've had some bad experiences, I don't even want to go in the room. And so what we've done now is made the room an uncomfortable and popular place. And so I'm resistant before we even get there. Why does the brain remember that a shower is a scary thing? Because brains that learn have hippocampal damage still have amygdala or emotional control. And, and it feels threatening to take a shower because the water hitting your skin is a really, really intense experience. And it makes you cold because body temperature 98.6, room temperature 75, water is a conductor, it drops your skin temperature, and you feel exposed. Humans, I mean, it's just a self-protection thing. And the parts we really want to get to are things that typically when you're scared, you, you hide and protect. So I really need you in a decent place to do this. And so what I might do just to start fresh is I say, tell you what, you know what? Just freshen up because we're going out here. Here's a washcloth with some soap on it. Try that. Yeah, get this. Now you may want to, okay, let's go ahead. Yeah, good. Here, rinse it off. Great. Now here's your deodorant if they use it or if they don't. Okay, you know what? Oh God, we got your bra wet. Tell you what, here's a fresh one. What am I not saying? You're dirty, you need help. Right. This is like, and am I letting go of the shower for right now? And I would say, yes, I am. Because I've got to recognize in this moment, I need to build back a relationship of trust, a relationship that is really focused on this person is, is, a, is a good person. And we can get back to maybe showering but not right away. And I will, I always offer and, and put a towel over somebody when we're going to do a shower and wet people through the towel. And I, I will even get a slit, they cut a slit. I do buttonholes and put a great big button on the front. So sort of like my thing here, only it's just draped over the person, one over the other. And now what I can do is I can go underneath and we can do pits, but if you so see maintaining dignity, is that yeah. the so you, it's actually you yeah. can't see and look, I have something on my shirt. I didn't know it was on there. When did I notice it? When I saw it in the mirror. And so when we're in the bathroom, we're in the mirror, I might see something and say, well, how did that get on there? Oh, God, I need a fresh one. And now who spontaneously is taking something off? Right. But what I try to do is get you to see what I see. Yeah. And get you to know what I know. And it's like, we got we to gotta shift gears if we don't want to have arguments about my brain versus your brain. And we might have to be willing to let go of a shower to look at wash-ups for the short run at least, and maybe for the long run, because research shows us that people who become incredibly distressed during showering about 70% of those folks have a history of sexual, physical, or verbal abuse in their background. And what we might be looking at is trauma-informed care. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I didn't even yeah. think I mean, about. and if you think of being naked and somebody helping or touching you and doing things, and then we get this negative interaction going on, yeah. about get in the no mom come on no just let me and we don't mean to you need to without meaning to it could take the person back to a place of intense distress that happened when they were little and it was absolutely forbidden to share wow. uh tipa there there was another question that had come in previously which is kind of an extension to this and i think really important 
how do you help your spouse in washing up dressing when they no longer see you as her husband, but as a father or some other person, right? So yeah, like that's happening with my mom all the time. She's she's yeah. thinking people are her parents, my dad, yeah. me, like her parents keep coming back. So what do you do in that case? Do you pretend like you are? But if if it's washing up or if it's showering, your dad wouldn't be giving you a shower as a right. Adult. And so yeah, so we you know this gets really funky sometimes. And I will say it's sometimes the place at which this is many of us in the world of family, where I want to be your daughter and your family member, and I'm going to be your carer. And so at first we can do that. And then there comes a point in this condition where I've got to acknowledge I can choose to be one or the other, but for you and for me, it doesn't work for me to be, try to do both. It's going to wear both of us out or it'll wear one of us out. And so what I need is someone who can take on the role of support and care, and I'm going to keep the role of somebody who loves you and likes you and wants to be with you. And I've got a flex depending on where you are in your life. So if you literally think I'm the old woman in the relationship, even though you're my mom, I'm going to say, Deborah, hey, how's my favorite girl? Because if I don't, we can't have a relationship of love. Now, I didn't say, how's my little girl? I didn't say, but I didn't say, how's my favorite lady? Which I might've said if you were more older, but you didn't recognize I was your daughter. So I have to prepare myself and practice the very words that I, I have myself say so that we can truly come together. But care might need to be delivered by someone else in a role that is more comfortable for that person living with dementia and me, <laughs> or it might be that I choose to be the carer and someone else takes on the responsibility and role of being more of a family member. And so families are so diverse. You sort of have to see what works for everybody. Um, I'm a natural carer. And so I can do some things that for some people would be like, yeah, no way. But then I can't do some other things. Some other people are really good at, yeah. you know, so it's finding your space. So this question comes up in different iterations um, quite quite a few times. Um, I'm going to frame it from someone who wrote to us and said, my 74-year-old sister has dementia and is in a nursing home. I live a thousand miles away. I call her. We can have a good conversation about the past. Her memory is pretty good for things that happened 50 years ago, long term, of course. Um, anything current is difficult for her. How can I best support her when I live so far away? But I'm going to tack this on to another question we've gotten, which is my loved one is in a care home. How often do should I be going to see her? Okay, so let's do the long distance where you only have phone. And I would say, have you ever tried Zoom or FaceTime? Because one of the curiosities is sometimes people will be fine with a voice, but when they see a face that's old, it, it doesn't match up. And sometimes they're absolutely fine with it. What's cool about Zoom or FaceTime is I can go, Debra, take a look at this. What do you, what do you think? Right. Do you, do you like it or do you not like it? You would say one or the other. So you can say you like it. Yeah. You know what? I thought we could write a note and I'll mail it. So this is for Betty. So it's a thank you note. And she sent me this mug. What do you think I should write in the note? Because now we're not just talking about the past. Now we're talking, you know, and you could do it with only words. It's harder when people are in the moderate state of dementia to hold on to all the words, which is why I like Zoom and FaceTime. I can hold something up. I said, look at this. Isn't this cool? It's a notepad. And it's shaped like a hand. And I know to place it to the side of myself so I can get us to focus on it. Yeah. And then I can say something about it. 
So for people who are long distance, Zoom or FaceTime or Skype, if you have someone on the other end who's supporting the person who can turn it on and turn it off and get them to the screen, I've had great interactions with people long distance. Um, if I have a support person who just is in, and at, often activity staff, that's one of their responsibilities is to set people up to connect. Visiting. My rule is keep it short, keep it simple, and only as often as your heart will permit. So don't feel, don't feel obligated. Like I have to go every, every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. It's more. <laughs> and one of the problems is you're thinking they know how long it's been, but we have plenty of evidence. They don't have any, when you're not there, you're not there. When you are there, you are. As soon as you leave, people will sometimes think, well, my daughter hasn't been here for months. And you think, well, that's not fair. I was just there. And it's like, Yes, and she loves you very much and she misses you a huge amount. And remember how the hippocampus keeps up with the passage of time? Because she loves you a whole lot and she misses you very much, it feels like this 15 minutes since you left has been months. Get over it and be celebratory because you just heard how much she loves you. Yeah, that's so true. We're often like our worst enemies and, and so hard on ourselves, right? But again, step into that reality. Um, okay. So you know, 10 minutes of a good interaction is so much better than an hour of misery. Why bother? Yeah, that is so true. Um, okay, this is practical. I, I, there's two practical questions that have come in. Okay. Um, let's start with this one. I cannot find a dental clinic, I guess mm -hmm. same, same problem as hospitals that we spoke about, to clean dementia patients' teeth. Yeah. They do not wish to use anything to put them to sleep. What do you suggest? What can I do? Now... Can I just tell you what we did? And I'm not sure this was the right. My dad made an appointment for my mom to get her teeth cleaned. And my sister and I are like, that's crazy. Why does she need to get her teeth cleaned? No. And we canceled the appointment. Now, I'm not sure that was the right thing to do, but like, we just thought the stress of her keeping her mouth open and this thing and, and with like the, the goggles and everything would be incredibly frightening. So one of the things I would recommend is, well, let's assess and see how it is. So let's put, have somebody put on a gown, put on a mask and let's get, you know, not the dental floss tools. I mean, just dental floss on one of those little plastic placket things. And then the pointy thing. And I, I encourage people to really think about hand. I mean, that technique I have of hand under hand really does make a difference. And the second hand is actually stabilizing the person and just see what happens when you're doing their mouth. If they're, and I go, uh, and the person holds it open while I'm fiddling around in there, or the person is like, no, no, get out, leave it alone. If somebody is that way in that situation, going to the dentist, me. but on the other hand, if I have somebody who like, they go into the zone, like we get them in that environment where there's the chair and you lean back and they've been somebody who's maintained their dental hygiene really well their whole life. It's amazing how many times the old memory pops up because you get them in the right place at the right time and the people are doing the right thing. I'm always present with my person. And I've always prepped the dentist that if I say stop, I'm, you need to stop right then. Or I say to the hygienist, when I call stop, you need to come out right away and be done. And I'll use the person's hands and say, she's going to be in your mouth. Here we go. We're going to do it. Um, and sometimes, you know, if they're able, we'll put a block in. But the problem is you have to be careful with the blocks, the, the foam blocks that help the mouth stay open. Um, because if they open even wider, then we have to fish the block out. Um, but I've had people pretty advanced be able to do oral cleanings if it was part of their practice, if it hadn't been something they'd been familiar with, uh, I think it's time to call it off and just work on mouth care. And that's pretty much all we're going to be able to manage. And even that can be real challenging for some folks. Okay. And then the second thing that comes up all the time, and you and I have discussed this before, um, is driving, of course. That's um, the question. Um, so yes. we've had for this uh, two people who have written in, um, one has said, my husband was diagnosed with moderate stage dementia. He can still drive around our, our town and home, but not any farther. Um, he hasn't gotten lost 
when should I stop him from driving? He's very forgetful now, please help. Another person um, uh, elaborated even further and said, um, my husband has the same problem. If he was to cause an accident, would we be liable? A doctor has not told him he can't drive, but um, could someone bring a suit against us knowing he has Alzheimer's? They absolutely can, and it is happening, and you can lose everything you have. <laughs> um, because yes, um, in many areas, having a condition of, of dementia and continuing to drive, um, even if the doctor hasn't told him to stop, um, that's on the doctor should be, I, in, again, this is my practice is I say, I think we need an evaluation from a driving clinic, someone who's like, I would use a real driving clinic for people who have neurological issues. Um, and there are often clinics around, you can find them sometimes OTs, sometimes PTs, sometimes, uh, driving therapists who really are looking at the person's, not only their routine behavior, but, oh, geez, what happened? And so there's a surprise and they have to react to it because it's one thing to drive if nothing unusual happens. But if something surprises you when you're driving, you have to be able to deal with it. Um, continuing to drive in moderate state dementia means we have people driving motor vehicles who are primarily using binocular vision and memory of driving. So I'm hoping that they'll look enough around to not miss something vital. Um, the risk of having a significant accident that injures someone or could kill someone, and we've had it happen multiple times. Um, the only group more likely to have an accident that's significant than this population we're talking about are um, teenagers driving in a car with other people. I mean, and that's pretty intense. So it's definitely something that should be evaluated by professionals who are aware of the on-off nature and the individual nature of dementia. Some people who've been excellent drivers their whole life can sustain it for longer, but all it takes is something happening. And so starting the process of saying, you know, there'll probably come a time when we can't do the driving ourselves. My idea is we start to get used to Uber or we start to get used to asking somebody to take us and get used to the passenger seat before we need to. Yeah. I was going to ask our daughter, Deborah, to take us somewhere just to see how it feels. Would you rather sit in the front or the back just to try this out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, Normalize it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember you told me too, because when, when my mom was experiencing heightened anxiety, when she was a passenger in the car, she'd start to scream when I was going 25 miles per hour to a stop sign. Normally she'd be like, oh my God, you know, and yeah. you explained it to me. That's that loss of peripheral vision. So things are more intense coming at you. So even operating a vehicle with that much, you know, heightened sensory load um, is, is a really scary thing to think about. And people can be safe, but slow, which is fine as long as there's not somebody around them wanting to go fast, because what can happen is people start going beep, 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 beep. And it's coming from behind and you're trying to figure it out or the ambulance starts to come by and your brain goes, oh my God, what am I supposed to do now? And that panic state now I come out of it. I might even pull over. Now I have no idea where I was going and how to get, it's like, oh my God, now I don't know where I am and what I'm supposed to be doing because it wiped out that forgetfulness thing. Often those things can wipe it out. And now I don't know how to get somewhere. And I don't think of using my cell phone to call you. And even if I do, I don't know how to describe where I am other than I'm uh, the ambulance came by here and it's like well where are you I'm on a street where well there's four lanes okay well what's nearby houses well great yeah uh, well, <laughs> I hope I you mean, have GPS I, <laughs> I remember asking myself the question is it possible that mom could forget confuse what what the uh, gas is and what the brake is and yeah definitely okay she should not be driving right yeah. I mean, yeah, mine is, I'll usually ask somebody, would you be okay with putting your grandkid in the car? And yeah, that's a better one. 
And if the person says, Ooh, no, I don't, I mean, I don't think so. No, I, I wouldn't be. And it's like, well, then that's what you're doing to other human beings. So yeah. it's probably that's time a good for, way to stay. It's it. time for someone to have the conversation, yeah. but I can tell already it shouldn't be you. Yeah. Um, Lynn <laughs> has written to us um, saying she cares um, for her wife with PCA, PCA, mm -hmm. posterior cortical atrophy. That's right. She has been a hundred percent dependent for years. How can anyone take the waiting to die? And, you know, that's, that is such a real, thank you for asking that because that is such a realistic question that so many people don't even want to think about, but everyone thinks about, right? Or, or no, so many people don't want to voice that, but everyone thinks that. And that's so it comes into your mind. It's like, how long is this going to be? How long is this going to last? I mean, I don't think my question back is what is her joy and, and, and pleasure in being alive? What does she still seem to enjoy? What is it that keeps her on this earth? There's either unfinished business or moments of joy she's still getting. So tell me, think hard. What could it be? Because that's what's sustaining her. The condition is making it really hard for her. And now I'll flip the question and say to you, what are your moments of joy? And if you can't find them, you're the one I'm worried about not surviving. And we need to work on the sense of loss and grief you are anticipating already and the depression and the sadness you feel losing this deep, meaningful, powerful relationship. And my question is, what do you need from her to be complete and what does she need from you and and how can we help one another get to a place of completion um but and so uh, it's, people, I, I, people are commenting on this too i think we've hit a real nerve because we're all we that is such a uh, a poignant question to ask um but there's a lot of people out there who don't have a choice right i mean they're they the sole caregiver yeah. They don't have a choice. So what then? They need a support system. And they, I mean, and that's the thing we get in. You're still here, but you don't have the support you need to do this anymore. This talking with somebody, this really being and working through it and, and bringing up things that are happening now and, and starting to acknowledge how much are we clinging, even though we don't think we are, we're encouraging. Deborah, one more bite. Come on, open. Can you open, please? Come on. You can do this now, swallow. I need you to swallow. Can you swallow for me? And that sounds loving, but it's not. It's a plea to stay. And it's time to look hard and hear the person say, I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty, but you need me. So I'll stay and I'll try to do it again versus you don't want it. Okay, I hear you. You know what? How about a hand massage? How about we listen to this music? How about, and we learn the art, truly, we are not trained for the art of letting go of someone in slow motion. Yeah. And it is slow motion. It is. Yeah. It is. Okay. On the, the opposite side of uh, the spectrum, it, we have so many people who have told us about misdiagnosis or non-diagnosis, right? Um, and Paul writes in and says, my sister-in-law has been experiencing increasing memory loss over the past couple of years. I feel she's lost her power of concentration and focus. Her mind appears to be racing from one subject to the other next. And as a result, I feel she's not grasping what she's hearing and, or observing. Is this a sign of dementia? And what can be done to improve her concentration and focus and ability to grasp and remember things? It for sure is a sign of brain change. And it's a sign of brain change that is not a healthy brain change either. I mean, the reality is that's not a healthy brain change. That's a sort of a challenging brain change because it means she's unable to sustain focus. And what she's getting is a lot of disrupted uh, thinking process and ideation and visual regard. So it's time to pause a second and go, okay, so that's prefrontal stuff. That's a lot of prefrontal. I need to know, is it auditory mostly? Is it visual mostly? Or is it a combination? 
And if that's the case, how is it playing itself out in daily life? Because those are the things we need to first identify. Because if not, what can happen is we could think we're treating anxiety. We're not treating anxiety, we're treating brain change. And so acknowledging, it sounds like for, at least from her brother's perspective, it's at least MCI, a mild cognitive impairment. But it's not memory, which says to me, it's more of a prefrontal cortex, maybe with some components of also the left temporal lobe of language, because it seems as though language, she's having a hard time getting language in and processing it. But what you would want is somebody who can help you look at what's working and what's not before we dive into the possibility of dementia, because there are other things that can do that, including hormone problems, thyroid problems, um, medications she might have been placed on. It could be estrogen loss um, at change of life. There's so many possibilities that we want a good evaluation, someone who's going to take a big step back. Let's rule out some stuff. Let's see what diet and that I mean, what's changing for her other than her brain. And if it's not, then it's time to get in with somebody who's really curious and interested in a longer term relation than a quick I've got this one appointment. We're going to do this quick eval and we'll figure out whether, you, well, you don't have Alzheimer's, you know, come back in a six months and we'll see if we can identify what, I mean, it sounds to me like you might need a medication for agitation and, and anxiety, or maybe you need, I mean, it's because the system is set up that way. Okay. And there's a question that we got and you, you, you touched on this, but I think it's a really important question for all of us. What are the signs when caregiving is taking a toll on the caregiver and it just becomes too stressful. So how, like we're all human, but this is our loved ones. It's a parent, it's a spouse. And we feel this obligation really to give our all, but what is the sign? What, how should we check in within our own selves? Cause you, you pointed to that already that oftentimes it's the caregiver who takes the most stress. So when do we yeah. know? So we know things like, how do you rate yourself? Would you say you're stressed, but managing it? Or do you feel like you're in distress multiple times? When you have distress multiple times in a day, that's too much stress. We need to figure out what to do with that. Second, how well are you sleeping? Are you not sleeping? I'd say at least six hours, decent, good quality sleep. And if not, it's time to look at that because what we don't always recognize, we might be having issues with sleep apnea. We might be having issues with sleep, which is impacting our brain, potentially brain changes. Then we have our third one, which is, are we feeling socially isolated, trapped, or abandoned by others? And if you feel those words are appropriate, abandoned or trapped, mm, it's definitely time to get some support in place or reevaluate your role because it means trapped or abandoned is a dangerous place to be. Tell me what you're uncomfortable with or what you find painful. Because when we start unpacking what's uncomfortable, what's actually painful, when we have more things that are painful than uncomfortable, it's time to back it down and find some other kinds of ways or supports for doing it. And finally, when you look at yourself and you say, I am not doing anything right, and I don't like myself, or I don't like what's going on, or I don't like my person, it is definitely time to go, ooh, if you can't find something you like every day, your primitive brain is going to tell you that you are not thriving. And frankly, with you have no ability to thrive, you will not survive long as a carer. You will start to burn out and deteriorate. And if you're already there, which many carers are, it's time to recognize I could use some support. And if you have to keep going, you definitely want some different support in place to make this work. Tifa, as always, um, I, I really can't thank you enough. And I, I also imagine this world where if all of us care, like even just to call a girlfriend who's going through the same thing, it helps tremendously, you know, and 
all of these questions that were asked today are things that I can totally relate to. You know, it goes on within my own family. It's never easy, but talking to you for some reason, and not for some reason, obviously, it just makes it all that much better. So thank you from really from the bottom of my heart. I love you so much. And you make so many people's worlds so much better who are, are facing and living with dementia. Um, so thank you. Um, oh, I, when we I, come together and support each other, it, it changes everything. So thank really you, does. Deborah, for what you do and the opportunity. Okay. Well, so, and, you know, a lot of questions were asked today. We're going to post Tipa's interview on beingpatient.com. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter because that's when we tell you about people like Tipa coming to join us. Um, we're really the live talks, the patient perspective talks, it's all for your benefit. Um, we, we offer these absolutely free. Uh, we just want to make your world better. So thanks um, from being patient and to Tipa Snow for your time and your just incredibly intelligent and helpful thoughts um, and experience. Thanks, You're welcome. Tipa. Thanks, Deborah. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. And we will see you next time.